Well, they don't greet us with a theme song, or even opening logos, so that's a good start. The snowflakes of this detail were only one establishing shot and nothing more. That was a neat story, Grandpa George. Child acting. Told me a Christmas story. A Christmas story. Reminding me of better films I could be watching right now instead of this one cliche. Neither of these shots can decide how Grandpa George is supposed to sit. And now if you're excuse me, I'm just gonna stare out this window doing nothing until the transition ends. Nice sunroof, but what are you gonna do when it rains? I mean, it must be uncomfortable to drive with that thing closed. Now, wait a minute, I'm going out one package today. Really? You had plenty more when you drove over here. And if you try to say that all these presents are for other towns, his truck is almost empty when he's delivering the package. On that note, why is this package the only one that's not wrapped in Christmas paper? I can't believe it's Christmas, been waiting for a million hours. A million hours is 41,667 days, or 2,738 years. I highly doubt you've been waiting for Christmas that long. Seriously? Over the course of a whole year? Or 2,738 years? That's disgusting! Lenny forgot to wear his mouth in this shot. This episode takes the conveniently timed commercial cliche to a whole new level by having the TV turn on all by itself to play it. You want a toy that's fun! You want a toy that's cute! But most of all, you want a toy with a fully functional buzzsaw built into its right arm! Two weeks later, this toy would be recalled for being a choking hazard. Buzzsaw Louie also knows the true meaning of Christmas. Well, that's gonna date the toy almost instantly. Delivery not available to Punxleyville due to the collapse of the Punxleyville branch. Which I'm sure will play absolutely no part in this story whatsoever. Not a bit. So take it from me, Mr. Nezzer! Santa Claus. And this is why commercials should never be live. Billy has more toys than you. Who's Billy? I don't know, but he has more toys than me. I see. Soon everyone will know that Wally P. Nezzer is the wiliest Nezzer of them all. I don't think that's a title you'd want, seeing how your brother tried to kill three people in his wily. It must have been the worst Christmas ever. Worst Christmas oh, ever yes, cliche. It was. Didn't like the sound of the words that was coming out of his own head. But he was just a toy. Maybe he was wired different. Who knows? Anyways... Sure is hard to hand wave a plot hole when you don't have any hands, isn't it? Oh, you've gotta be kidding me. I could tell those toys were 2D images even when I was five. Sun Bob the Tomato and Larry the Cucumber from nowhere. This must be the trail to the Pugsleyville Bridge. How could you infer that, what? seeing just a that gate with skull and crossbones on it? You know. Oh, and real nice job protecting people from this dangerous, life-threatening bridge with only a single yard-long fence. I'm still not fully convinced that this bridge will play any sort of important role in the plot later on. Could you please remind me of that bridge a few more times in the next five minutes so it's ingrained in my memory? The fact that none of these guys question why this toy's alive. Hey, I know someone who's really, really smart. Maybe they could tell us what Christmas means. This smart person is non-binary for the sake of leaving their gender a mystery to the audience. Well, um, it was, uh, me. For about five seconds. But I didn't want to just give it to them, so I read them a story. And after you read them that story, then you just give it to them. I love how Louie only prepares three cups of hot cocoa, because as we all know, toys don't drink. And neither do vegetables, for that matter. They're so enthralled by this Christmas story as they're hearing it, yet as soon as it's over, they're like, Wait, what? I don't get it. What was the point of all that? On second thought, that sounds like every other Christmas story in the world to me. But that TV commercial didn't just go to Dinkletown, it went everywhere. We've got to tell everybody! Or at least, but everyone Christmas with the television tomorrow. that was on, How and tuned to that exact channel at that exact everywhere. time, which even in the era of TV channels in two digits Pugsleyville. should be unlikely. The bridge is out. You can just forget about Pugsleyville. The bridge is out. Can we make a game out of how many times they bring up this bridge? It's almost as if it's going to be essential to the plot later or something. No, we gotta get into that toy factory! Excellent plan, Junior. Oh, and uh, good luck climbing those insanely steep mountaintops on the way over there without any proper mountain climbing equipment. Or hands. I still don't understand why we're here. You'll just have to trust me. Any particular reason why Junior couldn't have told them on the way over here? So our villain capitalizes on toy demand with a fair legitimate business, no strings attached. And what do our heroes do? Why trespass into his private factory, of course. Were the Sunday morning values on coffee break or something? Now, Junior figured that since it was a TV commercial that got him into this mess, maybe another TV commercial could get him out of it. Let's just assume that the exact same people that saw the first TV commercial are watching TV right now, let alone the same channel. Laura's mom loses half of her eyeliner in one blink. Listen, everybody. When it comes to Christmas, I know how Louie told him about... Oh, come on, George. I wanted to hear what Louie had to say. Jeez, what kind of stupid narrator would cut people off like that? That's my toy. 
That's my TV studio. Mr. Nazareth is more concerned about people breaking into his TV studio than he is about the toy that he made inexplicably coming to life. Now, if you'll excuse us, we'll just stare intently at this camera doing nothing until the plot catches up. Oh, here it is. So what's no, the point of tying these kids up? All. Most of them don't we have hands, and the ropes are tied in such a way that they could just hop really off the sled if they wanted to. Just don't send us to Bugsleyville. The bridge is out. Bugsleyville! Wow, that town was actually part of the plot after all. Well, who would have guessed? Oh, and that's decent punishment. You trespass on my property, I'll throw you off a bridge! Rawr, we're gonna chew you out for nearly killing three of our children. Really? Nope, we're just gonna give you a teddy bear. And ignore that we looked so angry five seconds ago. That's our poker face. Okay, everybody who's got hands, start tying. Or you could just bail out. Nothing is stopping you from bailing out like you did last time. It's ready! Wait, what happened to all the knots in this rope? Wink. Mr. Nazar. Well, that one line of defense held up pretty well. Whoa. Why, he filled Dinkletown with new tables and chairs and hutches and... All of which are toy size, negating their purpose. I'm from the IRS, and I've come to attack charge. One hundred and twenty-two seconds of theme song. Uh, I'm Bob the Tomato. Bob starts the show without the slightest glance to see if Larry was right next to him. Um, Larry, you've got an oven mitt on your head. So, last episode he had a shoe on his head and nobody complained. Simply everyone is wearing them. Well, all the cool people anyway. Larry outright states that his best friend is not cool. Hey, that reminds me of a letter we just got from- This is the first time that one of Bob's letters conveniently coincides with the exact problem Larry is having at the moment. I think we need Cordy for this one. Larry would never have thought that if it wasn't convenient to the plot. I want you to listen to a story about three boys named Rack, Shack, and Benny who were in a pickle just like yours. One, that is racist to pickles. Two, a pickle just like yours, because apparently being threatened the death sentence is exactly the same as possibly losing one friend. Anything that goes in or out of Nez of chocolate gotta come by me. Unless they own a vehicle that could easily just fly over the gate. Like this girl who owns a vehicle that could easily just fly over the gate, but it's polite enough not to. Also, I'm sure the only reason this truck can fly is so the animators won't have to bother with wheels. Because we work real hard at the chocolate factory. We start at 8 and we don't get lunch till 3. That's child labor. Excuse me, Miss Thumbler, but I've got an injury. Now get back on the line. You'll be just fine. Mr. Lunt is a cold-hearted individual. Now there's no time to play because we gotta work on it. And it is very fun. Yes, it's just so tiring to just sit back and supervise as a fully automated assembly line does all the work. Rack eats the tables. I'm not buying for a second that Bob Jr. and Larry are the same age in this world, nor am I buying their uncanny ability to hover slightly above the ground. There is no conceivable way for these boxes to close at the bottom without breaking the bunny. I'll give these animators credit, they're the only guys I know who can successfully animate the emotion of dawning fear on an animate confectionery. Can anyone make sense of this final stanza for me? Someday they'll come and join us! Who's they? Are they your families that you're sending money to? And if so, what do you mean by they'll come and join us? Will they be working at the Bunny Factory too? And why is this worth looking forward to? Yes, but how? What will change when they come to join you? I think there was something in the final story that wasn't translated very well here. Every day they make 14,638 of these little fellas. Even assuming seven hour days, it's about 2,091 bunnies an hour, or 35 bunnies a minute, or one bunny every two seconds, which is exactly what the assembly line typically cranks out on screen at any given time. Okay, Matt, you win this round. Why, his chocolate bunnies are selling so well, I, I think he's gotten a little big for his britches. It's lines like this that make me realize Mr. Nezzer is the only one here who's wearing any pants. Disapparating bunnies. Mr. Nezzer can afford a big screen extendable television, but can't afford it in color. This morning, Nezzer chocolate shipped its two millionth chocolate bunny. Congratulations, your factory has been open for less than five months. Oh, if I could just see the looks on their faces right now. But you can. It's called walking out of your office. Has anyone ever heard of not throwing unfinished bunnies into the air for no good reason? Baby Junior has had enough of Mom's nonsense. Where are these hands going? Thank you, Mr. Nezzer, for your lovely gift of chocolate. Chocolate. How would you like to be Junior Executives? What's it mean? It means you have to wear a tie. Check faces through a pole from nowhere. Well, what do you know? 
Rack Shack and Benny did what they thought was right, and it paid off. This time, anyway. Implying it won't pay off at all the next time. And it's gonna be a beautiful thing when everybody bows down and sings the bunny song. Ah, now I guess I gotta address the elephant in the room. The original version of the bunny song included lines such as, I don't love my mom or my dad, and I won't go to church, and I won't go to school. Which lines had to be removed in later versions of the episode because children started singing them in public, despite this being a song they weren't supposed to sing. So I could sing the original version for writing such offensive lyrics to begin with, or I could sing the newer versions for replacing the lyrics with such beautiful wham lines as, I won't eat no beans, and I won't eat tofu! These hands are holding a box and doing absolutely nothing with it. That's the furnace! What's it for? Well, that's where the bad bunnies go. Let's just say, in my mind, if you don't bow down and sing the song, you're a bad bunny. The fact that these guys never take legal action against their boss for threatening murder. See, this is the problem with retelling a Bible story in a modern time period. What would you do if you were them? Well, I would... Ah, better hold that thought. Then why'd you even ask? Thank you for attending today's festivities. Not like I gave you a choice in the matter, of course. Sing the song! Sing! Think of me every day. Nice troll move, guys, but you could have just said no and your intention would have been just as obvious. Every employee lost a bunny emblem on their hats when they planted their faces in the sand. Rack, I can't move my arms! Ah, uh, Benny, you don't have any arms. Mr. Nezer clips through the pipe. Unrealistically epic fail. And I suppose we can't use these vats of chocolate anymore. Way to waste valuable resources in the name of killing three people who didn't want to sing a song. Uh -oh. You're back! Well, that chase scene was entirely pointless. Oh, but look! My truck seems to be full of garbage! Mr. L this bridge is missing a piece. I said... No! No, your exact words Can't let you cook my buddies! You said nothing about anyone else doing it, and in this case, the laws of physics did the deed, not Mr. Nezer. Nobody's ever gonna stand up to me again! Except for the legal system, if word gets out that you murdered people. Well, it looks like four guys in there now, and one of them's real shiny. One more thing, boss. They ain't burning up! Here's a good lesson to teach your kids. Stand up for what you believe in and God will grant you complete immortality. Even if somebody throws you into the jaws of death, logic will take a backseat for you to survive with no damage done. Open dual door here, close singular door here, open hall with no door here. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? Well, you could sing one of our songs. Because when it's a Christian imposing their songs on people of a different religion, it's A-OK. -okay. To wash behind my ears. Uh, Shaq, you don't have any ears. Every time I see a building dance, I have to wonder what it's like for the poor people inside. Oh yeah, they kind of forgot about George after the silly song, didn't they? Okay, Larry, do you see that spoon over there? If you stand on that end of it, and I jump onto the other end, it'll fling you out of there, okay? Okay, but then how do you get out? Second, Cephalupian. Cephalian. Cephalupian. Uh, so Dexter, the next time you go to Billy's house, Maybe you could bring one of your favorite videos to watch instead. Note how he says videos and not TV shows like before. Self-promotion much? It isn't always easy, but knowing you've done the right thing sure feels good inside. Sure, at least until you've burned to a crisp in a fire for your beliefs, but other than that, good feelings all around. I'd like to get out now. I bet you're wondering why Larry has a shoe on his head. One hundred and twenty-two seconds of theme song. But you're wondering where Larry is. He was a little tired after the last show, so we decided to let him sleep in today. But don't worry, he'll be here pretty soon. Spoiler alert, he isn't. Unless you're talking about Larry as Joshua, though we clearly established that this Larry is just a figment of Bob's imagination. Victor has a problem. He says there's a kid named Lewis in his class who hit him yesterday. Darn it, Victor. Never name the name of your oppressor on television. Now he's gonna do worse than hit you for epically snitching on him. We have a story about that? When do you oh. not? Close your eyes, Junior, and don't open them until I say so. All right. Remember, kids, when a grown man tells you to close your eyes and not open them until he says so, you should trust him without question, especially when feeling a strong wind and hearing crashing noises in the background. How did we get here? 
we're using our imagination. Because that's exactly how imagination works. Lens flare. Why aren't they out here in the middle of nowhere? The same reason they were out in the middle of nowhere last now time, Junior. It's cheaper that way. Oh, the land God promised them was wonderful. You could grow things. For the longest time, I always thought Bob said you could throw things. And as a rebellious child the first time watching this, I found that notion incredibly awesome. Veggie Tales inadvertently gives children a bad idea of paradise. When Moses and the Israelites left Egypt, God's directions notably don't start in Egypt. God, I see Moses the set from Adam Blueberry the snuck into this right episode. Away. Do I know you? I'm the narrator. Self-referential narration. Oh. The Israelites were very sad about Moses dying. Yeah, yeah, he keep rubbing salt in the wound, why don't you? A dish that is filling, but bland. But All these tents have the physics way. of a pajama Sam click plane. He overlooked one little detail. And nobody else who could clearly see this detail stopped Joshua sure. from crashing into it. God! has given us this land for our new home. So, well, you're gonna have to leave. Why? They don't seem to be doing anything wrong, other than taunting you for your lack of offensive strategy. There is nothing in this adaptation that says the Jerichites and Israelites can't live together peacefully. What? Oh, so you're murderers. Okay. Well, things weren't going as smoothly as Joshua had hoped. So the Israelites decided to pull back and talk things over. I could have gathered as such without the narration, Bob, and frankly, Junior probably could too. This time, I really mean it. We should go back to Egypt. Assuming the Red Sea is no longer a ginormous obstacle that needs divine intervention to pass. Josh realized that this was a messenger from God. So Remember, kids, if a strange man walks up to you in the middle of nowhere and says they're a messenger from God, take all their words to heart. I mean, it's not like this man could be a spy from Jericho out to make fools of the Israelites by encouraging them to do nonsense tasks. That's totally not something these guys would do. We're supposed to hop around the city for seven days, blow our little horns, yell, and the walls are just gonna fall down. I'm sure that would work great if the walls were made out of jello. Jimmy Gord would be better than me at Cinema Sins. How are we clapping? I have no idea. <sighs> what they said. It's not because we're crazy or anything. Our God told us to do it this way. No, some creepy guy with a sword told you to do it this way, and he could be aligned with anyone. This irritating little song. Their words, not mine. Won't you join me in my irritating little song? Despite the blast radius, none of these slushies splash anybody until they're off screen. I've got slushy in my ear. What ears? Well, um... Time to fire up the Lominator, Jerry! Um, do you think that's a good idea? Of course he thinks it's a good idea. Otherwise, he wouldn't have brought it up. The fact that it takes Bob this long to realize that Junior isn't right next to him anymore. It didn't make sense when God told you to walk right through the Red Sea. But what happened? The water dried up! More instances of God defying all worldly logic in the name of proving that he exists. If only it were that simple nowadays. Sometimes God asks us to do things that don't make sense to us. Like walking around the city to make the walls fall down. Or being nice to someone who hasn't been nice to us. Hold up a minute. Rewind to the opening. Now in church, Victor just learned that God wants us to be nice to people, even when they're not nice to us. That's a fair moral value, I'll give him that. But it makes what they're doing now absolutely hypocritical. I gather the Jerichites aren't really being nice to the Israelites by blocking off the promised land, but really, what's the worst of two evils? The group that blocks people off from a single patch of land, or the group that knowingly takes away everything the other group has worked for just to claim that one patch of land for themselves? The people of Jericho hit him with everything they had! All they had was slushy? Jerry wore his eyes too high for this shot. We will tear down your wall and your eardrums! Don't worry guys, we had most of the Jerichites evacuated before the walls fell down. We're positive nobody got buried. Finally, after 40 years, they were in their new home! Their new home of endless dust and mountains of rubble. Welcome to the promised land, everybody! We're gonna march through the streets, walking hand in hand! What hand? No, scratch that. What streets? But did they really build a rocket in the middle of the desert and get slushies dropped on their heads? That depends. Did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego really work in a chocolate factory? I'll be right back. How did the French peas get all the way up there? Oh, Bob, you know you love the song. Oh, wow. Forgot about that one. Talking vegetables, I'm pretty sure that's witchcraft.
Okay, so I know I just said that they were vegetables, but if you want to be specific, both tomatoes and cucumbers are technically fruit. I'm not saying this to correct myself, I'm just pointing out the fact that a show called Veggie Tales is hosted by fruit. But I guess that's an easy mistake. It's not like they have something crazy like bacon on the show. Oh, wait. Larry's wide open smile as the show opens. Today we've got a letter from Lucy Anderson. The letter is big. I know that makes the scale seem a bit more accurate from an actual letter a child wrote to a tomato, but this is the only time this ever happens on the show. Dear Bob and Larry. Although Bob is reading the letter, you can hear the child's voice speaking it. Again, this is the only time on the show that this happens. Sometimes I think there are monsters in my closet. Wow, that child's voice is pretty monotone, even for a six-year-old. Ooh. Ooh. When Bob announces a video, Larry bends down on where the camera panned on Bob, and Larry stares down at what we can only assume is Bob's butt. If tomatoes have butts, which they don't. What the crap is he staring at? Well, then stand back and behold! Your shadow says short scallion, but your voice says Jimmy Gord. Also, they are anthropomorphizing their machines in this world, too, apparently. That is clearly a face. Not Jimmy Gord tells Frank and Salary not to go near the door just as he opens the door. Why does Frank and Salary do this weird waddle walk when everybody else on the show hops around? The camera pans off the TV and onto Junior as we hear a voice in pain. What exactly is Frank and Salary doing to that person? The vegetable. Fruit? Junior Asparagus is clearly taking some pretty powerful hallucinogenics in order to have such vivid hallucinations. Breaking and entering. Did Bob and Larry just break through the ceiling? And if so, where are the scraps of wood and shingles and stuff that would come with it? I'm Bob. I'm a tomato and I'm here to help you. Bob claims he's here to help, but he does know what he's doing is breaking and entering, right? Even if he didn't magically come from the ceiling. We couldn't help but notice that you were just a little bit frightened, so we thought we'd drop in and help. Did you hear that? Bob and Larry couldn't help but notice a five-year-old boy in his own house was a little bit frightened. I'm pretty sure there's some illegal activity going on here. You know, aside from the breaking and entering. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people, for unto you... Um, wrong story, Larry. Unsatisfied with simply breaking and entering, now they are breaking the fourth wall. Nope, I wasn't scared. Junior says he's not scared, even though we clearly saw him scared. I know this isn't a sin on the movie's part, but that is a sin on Junior's part. I mean, lying is still one of the Ten Commandments, am I right? Oh, we were just gonna sing you a little song. But since you weren't even scared, I, I guess I guess we'll just be on our way. Bob and Larry clearly know that Junior was scared, so they're just kind of messing with him in this scene. Sing the song! Junior's demands for them to sing would only later be one up by Mr. Nezzer in Rack Shack and Benny. How are they controlling the lighting in this scene? And who's making the music in the background? Song. If Bob and Larry are truly trying to help Junior get over his fears, why are they starting out with a creepy sounding song? I know it gets more upbeat and happy later on, but that's only later on. Again, they're messing with a five-year-old kid. Whose eyes are those anyway? Are they just floating eyeballs, or are those actual monsters in the closet? In which case, wouldn't that give Junior reason to be afraid? How can Godzilla fit in a hall? He's a giant friggin' monster who's bigger than Junior's whole house. Who exactly is this hairy creature, and how is he casting shadows on the wall? How are the tiny monsters phasing through a door? Are they using the same magic that Bob and Larry used to come from the ceiling? Also, VeggieTales poster near the pajama cabinet. So you're saying God's the biggest of them all, and he's on my team! God doesn't choose teams. If two people fight, he doesn't root for one of them. Or is he talking about the battle against Satan? Which he didn't clarify that, so this could be kind of confusing for a younger audience. Oh, by the way, there's someone else who wants to meet you. Was Frank and Salary just waiting on the roof of the house the whole time for Bob to cue him to come in? This is the same sound effect used from when Junior was hallucinating about his family portrait. Because using cliched stock sound effects once wasn't enough. Song. It's the same song as the last one. Where did Bob, Larry, Frank, and Salary, and the monsters go? Were they just Junior? in Junior's head this whole time? Was that VeggieTales poster in the background supposed to suggest that in this fictional story, in the fictional universe of VeggieTales, VeggieTales exists as a fictional show? I don't really know if that's worth giving a sin or taking a sin away, so I say we just leave the sin count where it is. 
extra sin for not having a sin for the water buffalo song. Judging by this scene, as well as the events of The End of Silliness, we can assume that Archibald has at least some sort of a creative control over silly songs with Larry. And if that's the case, and if he really does oppose the Water Buffalo song as much as he acts like, why did he ever let it get this far into production in the first place? Even if you made the argument that maybe VeggieTales is supposed to be filmed live, there still are rehearsals for live shows, are there not? Was Archibald just not there during those rehearsals? Archibald sucks at his job. Long, long ago, in a faraway land, Narration. Also, who exactly is this narrator? I mean, basically every other character from this episode has returned in later episodes, except for the narrator. And why couldn't Bob have done the narration? I mean, he's not in this story, so he could very easily have done the narration. He is the host of the show, after all, isn't he? Song. I see they took the easy route and just chose to reuse Mozart for their song. King Darius demands an interpretation of his dream from his three wise men and gets angry when they don't give him one. But why is he getting angry in the first place? He never gave them any of the details of the dream. They just got there. Unless they're supposed to be psychic or something, which is never brought up. So I think this is a sin on King Darius's part. Daniel squashes his face against the camera, and yet the camera itself does not move from its original position. Well, we interrupt this song to bring you more narration. So Daniel was able to explain the dream to Darius, and we can assume by this footage that Darius is giving him the details of the dream. Doesn't that kind of give Daniel a bit of an unfair advantage over the other three wise men since they literally knew nothing about Darius' dream at all? You see, each one of them wanted to be second in command. But there's three of them. Did each of them want to be number two more than the other two? Or do all three of them think that they can just share the number two spot? Ah, so I see that Franken Salary isn't the only one who does a waddle walk, but still, aside from Franken Salary and this one scene, this is the only time that any vegetable or fruit in any episode of Veggie Tales does a waddle walk. Song. Again. And it just might work! If all three of them knew what the other ones were going to say, why didn't they all just say it in unison? Or for that matter, why didn't just one of them say it? Maybe they are psychic. The very next morning. Narrator again. Third time, by the way. Song. Again. This is a musical, apparently. Do any of the characters on the show have knees? And a lot of the characters, like Bob, for example, are nothing but a head. Oh, now the narrator gets a song. Even when he knew it could get him in trouble. Did you say trouble? Boy, that is one flimsy fourth wall that you continue to break. The smallest wise man has to carry Daniel from his backside, with his head. I'm pretty sure that's height cyst. No, you cannot. You were just carried away from your house, for what we can only assume was about a mile or so. You're facing away from the direction where you came. You're not on a mountaintop or anything like that. You're not being elevated much, if at all, by being carried by the scallions. And on top of that, you are facing a pit of lions. You do not see your house. Goodbye. Hey, don't I get a phone call? Phone call? In BC Babylon? I don't know why Daniel would be afraid of being eaten by lions after surviving a fall like that. He's clearly invincible. We're not lying. Lion puns. Lions are gonna lie on you? They're gonna eat them! They're not gonna lie on them! Well, well, maybe they're gonna lie on him, then eat him. Or maybe they'll choose to lie on him after he's dead. Or maybe even lie on top of him in order to kill him. Oh no, what am I gonna do? It looks like I'm gonna end up as lions too. Daniel's song is just a variation of the song that the wise men sang. Oh no, what we gonna do? The king likes Daniel more than me and you. Don't cry, Daniel. The narrator's singing, again. Where exactly is that hole? Is it the same hole that the wise men just covered with a rock? And if that is the case, why didn't Daniel just climb out? I mean, even if it is a different hole, he still probably could have found a way to get out if he really wanted to. Okay, so the wise men are out partying and having a good time, but where exactly are they? This looks an awful lot like the lion's den to me. By the time everybody shows up at the lion's den, the rock they put in front of the hole has been moved. Who moved it? See you guys later. Thanks for the pizza. I had pizza? Well, now that's just silly. Lions have no opposable thumbs. How could they make the pizza, unless they called in for delivery on the phones that they clearly had back in BC times? And if they did order delivery, was it the pizza delivery guy who moved the rock out of the way of the pit? Because that would answer one question, but it would raise too many other questions, so we still have to send this. 
Surely your God is above all men. Dang it, why are there so many songs in this? Oh yeah, I almost forgot this all takes place on a countertop. How do they get all those sets for those stories then? Do they use green screen? And wouldn't that get rid of Larry? So blue screen maybe? One pound ground beef, three slices of QWERTY, this is a recipe for meatloaf! I'm sorry, but that's not a recipe for meatloaf, so much as just a list of things you will need for meatloaf. It doesn't have any cooking instructions at all whatsoever. Also, recipe for meatloaf? Is that where living food comes from? I thought that when a mother tomato and a father tomato... No, never mind. Over two minutes of theme song. So, who's got a question? So you started your show with no actual plan in the vain hope that your seemingly non-existent email. live audience would have a good question? I got an email! You got a what? You are so early 90s. Man, this episode is old. Ezio said he just did something that he knew he wasn't supposed to do. They're being so vague about Ezio's crime here. I mean, he had to have done something at least PG-13 if they're glossing over exactly what he did like this. The same thing happened to Junior Asparagus once. It did? I don't remember. Of course you wouldn't. You're never gonna know everything that happens in Junior's life, no matter how hard you try to know. Regardless, Larry is a jerk for leaving Bob in the dark here, both figuratively and literally. Bumbleyberg apparently has a severe poisonous fog problem that is never brought up in the episode. I especially like the part where the space aliens sucked all those cows up into their spaceship and then switched brains with the cows. That's less a part and more just the entire plot of the movie. What exactly created the fib from outer space? I understand he's a lie taken physical form, but what science fiction nonsense allows lies to do that here? If there was no such nonsense, I can only assume the moral of the story was don't lie or else giant blue aliens will come down and destroy your city. So we watch the screen for two years, and what do we see? Nothing! You never see anything you want to see, even though you would totally see it if we weren't trying to make a joke cliché. Good thing it was a particularly cloudy night tonight, or else this signal would have been worthless. Alfred's floating bow tie. <laughs> Cruelty the butlers. Way to protect people from crashing into the Larry Cave with just a single yard long fence. Whoa, deja vu. The meteor goes from totally visible to indistinguishable from the stars for no good reason aside from a clever shot. Also, if the meteor was that small the whole time, how could it ever have been visible from this far away? This does not look like a house that could hold two floors, but lo and behold, there's the staircase. Who stacks their books like this? They're pretty much asking for the books to fall over onto whatever's right next to them. The greatest bowler that ever rolled a ball! As opposed to all those bowlers that never rolled a ball. Junior thinks he can easily climb these shelves without proper shelf climbing equipment. Well, I wouldn't say that was entirely Junior's fault. The books probably would have fell eventually, whether Junior tipped the shelf or not. Laura is a bad friend for fleeing from the crime scene. How'd the fib get into Junior's house? Also, why was he hiding behind Mr. Snuggly while talking to Junior? Was he just messing with him? Kinda defeats the purpose when you're trying to come off as a friend. You must be new to the neighborhood. He breaks into your house and that's your reply? I mean, it's better than how you react to Bob and Larry showing up in your room, but your ignorance to stranger danger is still sinworthy here. The plate mysteriously vanishes off screen. It's Laura's fault. She broke the plate. You know, it'd be easier to come up with a lie if you didn't try to write a song around it at the same time. Good work, kid! Huh? Junior's line was cropped very poorly in this sh Junior flees from home with a guy he just met, all without his parents knowing. I doubt it's that safe for the peach to just be standing in the middle of the road like that. Or, is he sitting? And we haven't seen anything that looks like it came from outer space. Except for, you know, talking produce, but that's a given. Well... We did see a kid with green hair. And in a world of talking produce, most of which being green, that's not very notable. Why, you're just going to ignore the blue blob that's clearly not a fruit or vegetable that's hiding behind the asparagus? Alright, you'll regret this and all that jazz. Laura didn't break the plate. It was... it was... Lenny! Fool them once, shame on you. Fool them the second time with a completely different story, and you might as well consider a career in politics. I didn't even know he had a crocodile. No, all Junior said was he gave it to a crocodile. For all you know, Lenny went all the way to a freaking swamp to break this plate. You've got legs. Well, they're more feet than legs. There are no space aliens in Bumbleberg. He says, well, a giant blue blob with feet should be in his line of sight. Whoa, whoa, slow down. Another the time, I can't hear what all of you are saying. You didn't break the plate. And you didn't break the plate, it was these space aliens! Okay, but where's the motive? I understand Laura or Lenny, they could just be jerks, but why would aliens go out of their way all the way down to Earth just to break a single plate? Funny, I just saw that same thing happen in a movie! 
Really? Even the part about them breaking a plate? Was that really all there was to their plan, or was it just a goofy thing they did on the side? Now I'm genuinely curious since this is an actual possibility in their universe. Don't worry, Junior. A little fib couldn't hurt anybody, right? <laughs> and this is the point where the whole metaphor for lying kind of dies out in favor of mindless destruction. Drive away, drive away, drive away. Okay, sure, do that. Candyland. Oh, look! Alfred, you're showing me the blank side of the card there. Turn it around, it's not like there's an audience looking at the other side. I sure hope the rest of Bumbleberg is having a better day than I am. Irony. So, how did you not hear any of this until just now? Can you get to the water tower? The road is blocked! I'm afraid I'll have to go on foot! Or you could just drive up to the bump and walk from there. You're really making a bigger deal of this than you should be. The green button! It's the green button! So wait, you put the car alarm on a switch where the gear shift should be. Seems legit. That is a waste of perfectly good wheels. According to Alfred's monitor, it's still daytime. See here. Ah, we know what the monster is now. What is it? It's a lie. Even with the magic of 1997 internet, what research could Alfred have done to possibly learn this? Nobody knows anything about this monster except for the internet for some reason. Yeah, what was your plan again? Just bash face first into the problem and hope that kills it? The polygons on Alfred's monocle. Oh yeah, I forgot this story centered around Junior and that, you know, the title character. It was all my fault. Are we just gonna gloss over the fact that Junior basically kills someone? I mean, metaphor for a deadly sin or not, Junior kills someone, and nobody cares because monster. I think what you've been through today was punishment enough. That's not Gail Freeman. Doesn't it just warm your heart? And it's all because of one man. No, no, it's really not. Yeah, I know this signal means the city needs me, but I'm just gonna stand and stare at it for a while. In the name of a dramatic shot, no. No hard feelings if Bumblebee's in any real danger right now. This is literally the same shot as the last fib entrance, only mirrored and in a different color. Nowhere near Cordy here, suddenly in front of Cordy here. There is very minimal reason to split this verse up. Oh yeah, I totally forgot this show is about God. Way to only bring him up when there's five seconds left in the video. The only way for us to really be free is by doing what God wants us to do. Freedom equals servitude. He's not joking. Bob can read this. There's no need to panic cause this guy is manic and you know that will save the day. Lies. You need a hand. He's right there on the double. As long as he's not staring at signals or playing Candyland. He's a cucumber. He even says so in the record name. Where do you turn when this world needs a hero? Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, Iron Man, the Powerpuff Girls. This clip expresses exactly why Larry Boy is not good as a superhero, but it makes its way into the music video anyway. Loving your neighbor means tolerating their two-minute theme song for over 22 years! Why do I have a shoe on my head? I'm about to tell Latasha the story of Flibber Olu. And in that story, you, Larry, have a shoe on your head. So why is Larry wearing the shoe now? Don't they usually wait until after the countertop sequences change? And on that note, they always keep alternating between whether these stories are live or pre-recorded in relation to the countertop. Make up your mind! Hurry up and tell the story. My head's starting to sweat. Even more reason why they should have changed off screen like they always do. Literally the only reason why they didn't this time was so the countertop would have a punchline. On the mountains of Fibble, the wind and the rains never came. Yeah, I suppose that's a decent explanation for the lack of plant life anywhere. So the people of Jibberty Lot would look down and bellow at shoe-headed fellows. Look down. Your two towns are at about the same height. Speaking of height, I think the altitude got to everyone's head seeing how they go to war over something as trivial as the best headgear. Mine's really more of a kettle. Breaking the rhyme scheme in the name of a one-off joke. Not all of the people who lived in these cities were angry and bitter and vile. Wait, but you just said... Two tiny towns that were nothing but trouble. This is noticeably something but trouble. I get the feeling they forgot to animate Larry's mouth here. He's got this big, unmoving grin that he keeps for the entire shot, even when it doesn't fit. I'm tired of lying around like a squid. That's racist to squid. Gosh, this is fun. It's great that my lobster can get out and run. Hey, more of that forgetting to animate his mouth action. It's great that my lobster can get out and run. All was well until suddenly, the sky gave up. 
why they shook him so hard that he dropped his milk money. We hit the jackpot, guys. A whole penny. Guess our work here is done. Then he said with a moan. Larry noticeably does not moan. The sound he could hear was just the wind hissing. Which conveniently picks up now just for the joke to work before disappearing once more. The lobster is a bad friend. Do you have time to sing about how busy you are yet you don't take that time to just pull this guy out of the hole? I'm very important I can't stand and chat. She says before stopping to stand and chat. Also, they take the time to talk to each other about how busy they are but they don't take that time to get back to their businesses and or just pull this guy out of the hole. Still not animating their mouths. They looked at each other then said with a smile. We're busy, busy. You're not even real mayors or nurses, are you? Busy, busy, frightfully busy. You had time to set up a... No, no, I give up. They didn't put their mouths in at all for this shot. The nurse hangs a blank line on her wall because she's too busy to sign her name on it. He has a shoe and I have a pot. But when we look deeper, there's more that we've got. No, no, there really isn't. Your only defining characteristic in this story is your headwear. Who are you singing to? Now if you visit the mountains of Fibble, you won't see a shoe or a pot. Instead, they throw flowers and candy to nibble. They still need to work on their throw. Gifts never seem to reach the other town. And now it's time for silly songs with Laddie. Skip! The exhaust of the spaceship doesn't set Junior's carpet on fire. Ah! Who are you? I'm Bob! I'm a tomato, and I need your help! Whoa, deja vu. If you've been through this before, then why do you need a reintroduction as if last time never happened? Larry! What? How many times have I told you not to eat while you're wearing your helmet? How does he eat while he's wearing his helmet? Apparently, the chocolate just phases through it somehow, as Larry nimbles on one side to swing it off the other. Our starship, the USS Apple Pies, is in grave danger! Does anyone else see something wrong with the namesake of a ship filled with vegetables being mashed fruit? Incoming meteor here, no meteor here. Didn't you minor in aerospace technology at the Happy Tots preschool? Minoring in aerospace? Gee, I wish I made that much life progress in preschool. Potato. Trademarks. I forgave the breaking and entering since we're kind of in a life or death situation here, but I draw the line at evidenceless kidnapping. Also, the fact that Junior's parents don't hear any of this. Uh, I think my helmet's on backwards. You think? Something about this music makes me want to write an angry conservative letter. How many people are on the ship? 364! How many escape pods are there? Well, that was a stupid design choice. Also, the captain has his own mini ship complete with shrinker beam. Why don't we just have more of those for escape? Or even better, we use a shrinker beam to fit more people in the escape pods. A popcorn ball meteor. The worst kind. Yeah, not like those baby meteors made of solid rock or scrap metal. Popcorn is the most lethal substance in the world. How does Scooter ever balance on this leafy nub? No wonder this is the only episode he has it. Not the new guys. They don't know anything. Well, that's what condescending. Jerry is missing his headset in this shot. And don't tell me you took it off just to put it back on before the next one. Grab the gourds! Grab the gourds. Jimmy and Jerry were brought into the battlefield with no knowledge of what mission they had to accomplish whatsoever. Don't believe me? Hey, look, some kind of a planet or something. What is this stuff? That said, how did the Apple Pies crew expect the gourds to even approach the meteor, let alone decide to eat it? Do you think it's possible? What, the two gourds could eat an entire meteor over a hundred times their size in less than two minutes? Why would I not? Bob panics so hard, he slides back into the shot and pops away before running again. Okay, so maybe the gourds got carried away and ate their escape pods with the popcorn. My question is, how can they breathe? And how can we hear them? Well, I got a little bit hungry. So, I was just snacking on the side table. Setting a good example for kids there, aren't ya? No wait, that's not a table. That's a Klondike bar with legs. Also, how is it still standing with one leg completely gone? Plug it in! Yeah! Why didn't I think of that? Yeah, why didn't you think of that? Hit it, boys! Who are these boys? The microphone dances. We can have lunch, I'll share my jello. More trademarks. Awkwardly spinning all the way around the apple pies for no clear reason aside from a dramatic shot. They could have just made a straight shoot for Junior's house right about here. Dad, Dad, come quick! What is it? Oh, so now Dad hears the loud noises in Junior's bedroom. Maybe if the slime monster shows up and tries to squirt slime all over us, Fernando could maybe blast him with his x-ray eyes. Children's imaginations. Lieutenant Larry here dropped our map right out of the spaceship. How do you even do that? You're in an airtight dome with no windows while you're driving. 
could just give us directions to the freeway? Why do you need land directions when you're flying into outer space? Uh, unless they're talking about them getting back to the countertop, in which case, how far into this show within a show logic are we, really? Is this just a play, or is it actually happening and we're actually following an oblivious child with a thousand secret cameras? And now that I think about it, this scenario would explain why Junior's parents don't notice any kidnapping, as they probably approve the studio let the show happen. But the fact that none of this is actually made clear at any point in Veggie Tales is still a sin. Can we stop at Mr. Slucky? No, we need that money for tolls. Paying road tolls when you're in a tiny flying spaceship. This verse is actually Leviticus 1918b. They kind of dropped out the part about revenge in the name of their own context. The text on Cordy's screen mysteriously vanishes, but the background does not. By this point, I'd forgive the two-minute theme song, but just because you forgive a sin, that doesn't mean that the sin no longer exists. Keep that in mind as we continue. The other day, I was walking home from my bowling league. The unimaginable conflict of balls rolling balls. I'll tell Marco the story of... The Grape of Wrath. Oh, that's a classic. Because being a classic justifies reading depressing adult literature to small children. How did the grapes get past this tiny cliff? How are they flying? Why does the shadow suddenly disappear? Pa and Ma's glasses clip through their noses. There's shaky cam, and then there's everything shaking in different directions around a still cam. This is far more disorienting. The wheels sink into the sand. I might spin in your eye. Well, that eye is dead. The seed went right into his eye, and now he's half blind. Thanks, Tom. There's no escape from Oh look, he escaped. Guess you guys aren't so cranky after all. We must not hit a bump! Somehow this does not break their car. I did not, you taco salad rabbit, no! Using random and arbitrary words a clever insult does not make, you seizure gas station playground nugget lords. That would make him a casserole head iguana man! Ah uh, yeah, sorry about that, cabbage nose Elvis puppy. <laughs> cabbage nose Elvis bulldog! Also, that's racist to cabbages. Three sins in advance for all the needless close-up shots this episode. Either Rosie is a tiny flying fairy godparent, or her left pigtail has a mind of its own and is stretching out to hug this log. Those are my only two reasonable explanations for this apparent layering error. A sparafro. Which Junior's eyes happily clip through? Hey, bean boy! You and crew and peas to your noggin? Well, that's a morbid thought for a world of talking produce. Good thing the French peas don't exist yet. Well, jeepers, Larry. Well's jeepers, Larry. Luckily, Junior's dad heard him laughing, but didn't hear his son crying first. Priorities? Dad's disco tie. Junior's dad explained to the grape using narration as an excuse to avoid writing natural dialogue. I guess we never really stopped to think about it. You're probably in your 70s, and you're only just now taught that teasing is wrong? Insert Sideshow Bob clip here. Physics. What are they? The grapes laugh at a child that nearly suffocated in sand. Said laughing is a pair of two-second loops. So once again, Junior forgave them. What? That fourth wall. So Larry's the one telling this story, right? How does it suddenly become self-aware and start defying the narrator? I'm supposed to forgive them again? After what they just did to me? All they did was laugh. Even for a five-year-old, that cruelty's pretty tame. Rosie's not looking directly at the camera in this shot. I know that sounds like a weird sin out of context, but the narrator is directly talking to them right now, so the least they could do is look at him. Well, how many times am I supposed to forgive him? The simple answer should be for as long as you live, but they managed to drag this out for another minute or so. First of all, you don't know the context of this verse. For all you know, Jesus could be talking about how many times he's gonna die. Secondly, other versions of the Bible say to forgive people 77 times. I just assume we're going to ignore those versions because this number is bigger. Third, I'm pretty sure Jesus was speaking hypothetically here. Again, forgive people enough times they can't count the blessings. Please don't try to put actual math into forgiveness. You'll just open yourself to a bad time when I reach your 491st sin. Does anybody know what 70 times 7 is? They're called calculators. Even QWERTY should have that feature. Maybe you could be the grapes of math. Jumping into the car without opening the door, because that's safe. Hey kids, have you ever been bad? Hey, this isn't a silly song. Do you remember when you put your pet snake in Aunt Millie's pajamas and she ran five miles without ever getting out of bed? No, I don't remember doing any of this stuff. Have I got the thing for you? The new Ronco for give a Why would you even purchase a product from a company called Ronco? Just dial up your sin here. How do you dial up a sin? I'm pretty sure there's enough sin in the world that you can't abridge it all in 13 lines. 
In the last three weeks, we dug two miles through solid granite. Are you just reading that off a cue card? With your eyes covered by a hat? The moral of the story is never hang Earth's strongest knives from a ceiling prop. There will be injuries. Just spread these seeds on here, and, and in a few weeks, uh, voila! Gia, forgive a matic. Trademarks. The salesman is left in a pitch black room because the lighting guy was feeling particularly cruel that day. Good thing the knives mysteriously vanished or this salesman would probably be dead. Do you remember when we learned about forgiveness? How could I forget? Well, do you think the kids at home would like to hear about it? Do you really need to ask that question? I mean, what else would you do in this video about forgiveness? And if the kids really didn't want to listen, they could just stop the video. This needlessly convoluted camera pan. I guess the smiley son from last segment was on coffee break that day. Bob's death-defying eye twitches. And wasn't there a movie star and, um, that other girl? Yeah, but they canceled. Oh. I mean, we would have made the Gilligan's Island parody complete, but that would have required making entirely new characters, and we're pushing it enough with Archibald's wife as it is. Archibald pokes his eye out with his wife's hat. Miraculously calm ocean today, isn't it? I mean, if it weren't for this one boat, these waters wouldn't be moving at all. Wait, which one of you is steering? Seeing how none of you have hands, it's kind of ambiguous. I could assume the boat's just steering itself by now. We probably shouldn't be able to hear the whale's cries this clearly. I mean, they're kind of under a really thick blanket of ice right now. Also, how did they even get into this position? My only conclusion is that they were jumping into the water face first and the ocean just instantaneously froze over in a millisecond while they were doing it. Captain Larry will smack the iceberg and free the whale! Ah! Commander Bubba has come to congratulate Captain Larry for his flight away. No, I'm pretty sure he's here to call you a freaking lunatic for endangering the crew. We're making snow cones back there. Do you want peach or strawberry? Produce eating produce. Ah! At least the boat is still floating. Shouldn't have said that. Hi, Murphy's Law. I said I was sorry. Well, that's just not good enough. Bob does have a point. Maybe Larry should put in some effort to solve this problem instead of just sorrying everything away. But no, that's not the point of this episode, so that'll never be addressed. Goodbye, Bob. I hope you find a first mate that's good enough. Depression. I wonder where the skipper is. Probably in bed, seeing how I assume you just woke up. Did you say something? Uh, no, it was that tree over there. Really? Well, what did it say? You guys are not so bright! How did Bob get all the way up here? We can build a giant catapult to fling us back home. And hope we don't get caught in sharp winds or crash into seagulls or anything else that would otherwise change our trajectory and leave us stranded in the middle of the ocean. Look, see that curve? Even the model catapult can't be trusted. Hourglass mouth. Bob comfortably stands slash sits on an off-center bamboo stick without falling on himself. Gee, it sure does feel good to be forgiven when you make mistakes. Gee, it sure feels good to blah blah moral of the episode. Objects smashing into the camera don't get brushed away, but instead completely vanish. Bob and the rest conveniently find Larry at this shore by pretty much going in a straight line, while if Larry were at the opposite side of the island, he'd pretty much be gone by the time they find him. It would have been more practical to just split up. This is not how sailboats work. Also, Larry could have just built this raft bigger and took everyone off the island with him, actually taking initiative to make up for his mistake. But again, that's not the point of this episode, so we're just going to ignore that detail. What? Oh, come on, he's not that far away. Did you say something? No, it was that tree again. No, I'm pretty sure this is a different tree. The fact that it has a face should probably tip you off. Floating coconuts. Small thing, but Bob's eyes are detached from his nose in this shot. Palmy clips himself with his leaves. Hey! Do you like it? I made it entirely out of bamboo and coconuts! I made it entirely out of bamboo and coconuts! <laughs> I guess you finally had the courage to skip the theme song this time. You know, I honestly cannot see why people think this is a problem. A wise man once said not to be- Who are you? In the dead of night, the queen's bedroom is the only room in this entire castle with their lights turned off because plot. And the king can make his own sandwich. Literally 56 seconds into this movie and we are greeted with unwarranted divorce, unemployment, and potential hair loss from sleeping on curlers. All for refusing to make a freaking midnight sandwich. It looks like we're gonna have to find you a new queen. And then kick her out when she doesn't want to make you a sandwich at 3 a.m. Such is the great circle of royalty. Trains. What are they? I highly doubt anyone in BC times would have known that AD time was going to exist. 
Esther has irises, and according to half the VeggieTales fandom, irises are apparently the worst thing for any VeggieTales character to have, ever. And I am sorry, but considering how clear the seriousness of this topic is, I cannot make any exceptions. I hope you all understand. This score is recycled from King George and the Ducky. Ah, speak of the devil, there's an ad for that episode. And an ad for the Stuff Mart, despite the fact that it doesn't exist yet. But what if she doesn't want to be my friend anymore? Mordecai never directly answers this question. His Royal Highness, King Xerxes, finds himself, for reasons that do not concern you, in need of a new queen! Never specifying why the queen was fired, so history can safely repeat itself. No one sees any problem with a shady businessman luring girls into the back of a truck. You! Bow to me! Uh, no! Bow! No! Bow! Respectable grown-up conversations. Shoulder pads are so practical for a girl who doesn't have shoulders. But I don't even want to be here. Why do I have to be here? Because the king said so, and not complying means eternal banishment. Miss Babylon! I can assume more than one girl from Babylon was forced to be in this contest, so if they're classifying these girls by town now, there had to have been some elimination rounds before this. That said... What am I supposed to do again? Why does Esther not know the rules by now? Please, sing something! You're making me look bad! Actually, Esther's the one who didn't plan anything, so you could just disqualify her right here and now to save face. It's not your fault all the contestants are an embarrassment, half of them were being forced to do this. How does the orchestra know what song Esther's gonna sing? Wow, her singing voice is beautiful, almost as if it's done by a completely different person. But we have a new queen! Contestant 38 wins! And let's just ignore all the other participants who didn't sing yet, but could still probably do better. We'll never know now. Ladies and gentlemen! Mister, there are only two people in the audience, and neither of them are ladies. Whoop, never mind, we suddenly have enough for a full paparazzi now because atmosphere. Do you think she's gonna like me? You bet she will. You're the king! Everybody likes you, under penalty of death! Larry, typically the wittiest character in the series, plays the part of an ear voiceless scribe. Seeing how the Peony brothers apparently had ample time to set this whole trap up, I doubt the palace guards are doing their job right. And the murder weapon is a piano, because I guess giant anvils weren't hip in the days of ancient Persia. Any girl in the whole kingdom would be happy to make you a sandwich. Well, except for that one girl we just fired, but she's an outlier. And we could have taken over the kingdom if it wasn't for that meddling queen! You wouldn't have said it like that if it wasn't a reference. Banishment to the island of perpetual giggling! In an effort to censor the death penalty, Big Idea comes up with something even more terrifying! Ain't censorship grand? The right-hand wall renders too late. A zucchini-shaped sarcophagus is where you'll sleep. As opposed to a tomato-shaped sarcophagus. What does infant potty training have to do with banishment? No, I'm honestly surprised it took this long for the show to make a toilet joke. Come on over here, Queenie Poo! Queenie Poo. The second instance of toilet humor on this show. It's for the wedgie? Mm-hmm. Make it an easy one. Too late for that, King. The card's already been picked. Heyman's a cardian. Why don't you like me, Mordecai? Well, for one thing, you're banishing him and his whole family. Larry takes so much pleasure in slamming the door in Heyman's face. 17 silent seconds of pointless establishing shots. See ya, Heyman! Thanks for the parade! We never actually see this parade. Joke opportunity wasted. You had me banish the man who saved my life and my own queen? Wait, where was this authority when the last queen got fired? No. And Mordecai, he got Haman's old job. The number two guy in the whole kingdom. So would that make the queen number three? I don't think that's how royalty works. Or should work. Ever steered you wrong? We should go back to Egypt. Big people do big things. I think I saw a hairbrush back there. Little people do little things. She's had a bean boy. Oh, you guys can go one more episode without a created by credit, could you? Do you remember what we saw the last time we were here? So how many of you watched The Fifth Matter Space before watching this episode? To those of you who haven't and are really freaking confused right now, don't worry because all this vague continuity is entirely pointless to the plot. We're not supposed to talk to strangers, he says to a stranger. 
Every Monday morning, your mom gives you a dollar and 28 cents. But that's my milk money. Does that mean you only ever drink milk on Mondays? Also, this robber goes around stealing people's milk money when it'd be much more efficient to swipe their theater funds instead. I mean, I don't know how expensive theater tickets were at the time the show was made, but I'm sure it was more expensive than milk. It's not nice to take people's milk money. Implying that hanging people upside down off the edge of a building is any better. I counted 37 cents in this pile, meaning you're 91 cents too short. There is no physical way that these two backdrops can be the same billboard. Assaulting police cars. Alfred can get this POV shot of Larry Boy without a physical camera. For that matter, Larry Boy is staring at a non-existent camera. What kind of vegetable is this lady supposed to be? For the first and seemingly only time in VeggieTales history, we witnessed the actual creation of walking, talking produce. I never thought we'd be given a legit science fictional explanation for it, but here we are. So yes, there is a theme song, but it's short enough that I can let it slip by without a sin. Moving right along... Wanna save money on animation? Just leave us in total darkness for a while and use the setting as a punchline. Tomorrow we're gonna learn about rumors. Had it not been for that one snowy day in February, the whole crisis of this episode could have been avoided. Now why would anyone want to use the same voice clip twice in a row? I don't know. This does not look like a house that could hold two floors, but... Oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong script. What shot is this episode from again? Balls playing with balls. There's gotta be something wrong with vegetables cooking meat. I mean, granted, it's not technically cannibalism. Yet. I just read a book where dangerous robots took over the world. Dad Carrot has evolved from Jimmy Gord voice to incomprehensible Egyptian since the toilet saved Christmas. Alfred's miscolored cap. Oh, sweet, sweet Petunia. Why does this line give me chills? Hello, Larry. Listen, I need you to get Larry Boy. As much as I appreciate cheap jokes about a superhero's paper-thin secret identity, we still need to look back and find that the mayor contacted Alfred, so Alfred could get Larry, so Larry could get Larry Boy. Why can't Alfred just get Larry Boy directly? Gee, that danger sign is so helpful. Who knows how many people would have crashed into a giant wall without it. This disco lighting is completely impossible. Give Flipperoo some credit, at least they didn't pretend the sky was a solid wall. Why would Larry Boy go all the way into some random person's yard to catch weed when he should know that there's one hiding right behind his mansion? Attempting murder. Also, nobody is shocked that the city's superhero is just soda in their backyard. We rumor weeds know how a rumor can grow just like a big weed in the ground. Just spelling out that metaphor for all those three to eight year olds who didn't get it yet. Alfred's got a close eye on Junior. His plot convenience levels have become too high to ignore. I'm a rumor weed! Yes, it's true! Why are you so happy to sing with the guy that's holding your hero captive? It doesn't photosynthesize. Why do we care if it takes pictures? Oh. They're feeding off something, but I don't know what. Gee, what a mystery. It's not like she spelled it out for you in song form already. A tiny little story is all I need. These weeds are strong enough to break up sidewalks, smash through brick walls. Don't tell rumors, kids, or you'll be responsible for the destruction of a major city. Best moral ever. Well, you know, I'm just gonna lay back on this expensive machinery and assume I don't press anything. It'll be as fun as the time I sat on my laptop. Wasting perfectly good wheels and a perfectly good bumper. And now push the red button! Red button is bad cliché. Except it isn't. Alfred's just withholding information about his plan because apparently he likes watching Larry Boy think he's going to die. The Larry Mobile must have some pretty sweet insurance if these guys are so willing to throw away parts willy-nilly. Well, if that's your definition of a soft landing, what would too hard have looked like? The sewer walls must be blocking the transmission! Man, if only there was a giant hole in the wall a transmission could seep through. I mean, if it could get through rock and soil just fine before. But convenient sewer lighting. Letty Boy is battling a giant- Seriously? Is I Can Be Your Friend the only thing that ever plays on Bumbleberg's radio? Well, this is the most racially diverse cast of characters we ever had on this show. Now let's never do it again. He's got a shiny metal head, just like a robot! A shiny metal head that you've only ever seen him wear today. Seriously, Alfred, just take the helmet off and they'll believe you. Yes, just walk closer to the dangerous robot with laser eyes. Leave yourself even more open to his wrath. That'll make us safe. I'm not a robot! I'm British! Implying there can't be British robots. Mysteriously appearing bandage. <laughs> no lipstick. He's gonna take over the world! Now where did you hear that? The weed told me! That asparagus is the only sensible one in this entire city. No shadows here, shadows here. If you hear something about someone that sounds bad, 
or even just weird, you should ask them about it. Who are you talking to? Junior and Laura, or us? I ask because this is the only shot where you are staring directly at the camera. God doesn't want us to tell stories that can hurt. There you go again, not bringing up God until the very last minute. That's gonna frustrate half your audience. Actual murder. Is there a flower show? <laughs> you nearly killed us all. They told me that you are the children of God. You are cowards. Two minute theme song designed to overcompensate for how short this episode is. Danger lurks in the big city. The world needs a hero! That's a bit of a stretch, isn't it? One city in a particularly high threat level and that means the whole world is doomed! Would you give me a hand with my super suction here? It seems to have malfunctioned. What do you mean malfunctioned? It's a plunger. It's supposed to stick to things. I didn't know being a superhero could be so painful. Maybe you should just go back to being plain old Larry. Nah, plain old Larry's been about as painful so far. Oh, oh, oh. Back. Back. Oh, back, Bob. What do you think he's doing? <laughs> Public domain sneeze effect. Dave lived in a land called Israel. Not a problem exclusive to this episode or even the show, but I always found it somewhat on the nose that so many Bible stories take place in Israel. What, was the land of actually happened to overpopulated? There were mostly just sheep, especially around Dave's house. This patch of land has a disturbing lack of house. Dave had a lot of brothers, seven to be exact. Although we will only ever see three of them because budget. I'm kind of busy right now. Do you remember the time we dipped you in tar and stuck you to the backside of an angry water buffalo? Domestic abuse. Well, sometimes I think I could eat a whole spaceship. Uh, what's a spaceship? Quit doing my job for me, Jimmy. Nothing really exciting happened around there. Eh, sticking an innocent child to a raging water buffalo is the most boring thing in the world. The lima beans are, uh, lacking? The nectarines are quacking? Preemptive that's racist in case we get talking lima beans or talking nectarines in the near future. So the Israelites needed to protect themselves. We need to protect ourselves! Yes, Tom, we've been over this. See, this is why you were dropped from the show. Very compelling and intuitive writing here. Behold, the first appearance of the popular French pea duo Jean-Claude and... Christophe. The French peas need subtitles for their insults, but once they're actually given helpful exposition, then we're left on our own. Also, reading, when half your audience can't. And now it's time for Silly Songs with Laddie. Skip! Who will I fight? Wouldn't this count as forfeit, especially after 40 days of failed attempts? Man, these Philistines are particularly civil when it comes to enslaving colonies. Who's gonna fight him? What are you, nuts? He'd have us for lunch! Considering your species, I'm surprised you're not used to this fear by now. I am also shocked and slightly embarrassed by your hypocrisy. You're not going to sing, are you? Couldn't you just play your harp and I'll throw things at you? Biblical accuracy? Surely you just, Mr. Chocolate Bunny Factory in Babylon. David was this close to stabbing King Saul's eye out. Jimmy on right here, Jimmy dead center here. Here you have it, guys. Invisible hands are officially canon. This completely justifies any time I did not send their lack of it. Moving on. And this is the point where Goliath squashes David while he's distracted, right? Right? In one of these instant replays, Goliath's hat is missing. So is the sunset going that fast, or is the sheep going that slow? Honestly, I'd believe both. Ah, the two-minute theme song again. I thought Rumorweed was going in a pretty sweet direction with that, and you just had to backtrack. Top-notch. Today we have a 
text message from Libby. A text message? It's the latest thing. Cool, huh? Uh, I feel like it was only yesterday when email was the latest thing. Aren't we runs a hoot? Oh, uh, I got cable last month. Stand aside. We don't want innocent bystanders getting hurt. He says before slamming an innocent bystander into the wall. This is honestly the greatest name in the world for a candy store. Short, sweet, and to the point. Call the police! Call the police! Call, Call the police! Larry Boy flies this slow for no particular reason aside from a dramatic shot. We have received unconfirmed reports that we may indeed be seeing the return of Larry Boy! One, unconfirmed reports? What does that even mean other than what you saw with your own eyes? Two, the return of Larry Boy? When did he ever leave? Why did he ever leave? I know what they meant, returning after three years of no movies, but why did Larry Boy ever leave Bumbleburg? What was it about some guy stealing a single chocolate bar that made him come back? Larry Boy only needs nine seconds to soar all the way across Bumbleburg, pick up a box of chocolates, go to his mansion, start up the Larry Mobile, and drive all the way back. Gee, with how time efficient he is, no wonder he can afford to save a single chocolate bar. What's the deal with this TV screen only turning on when Petunia's on the air? It's kind of a waste of resources. Wow, the mayor's vanity is really paying off. She looks about 20 years younger than when we last saw her. Bananarama extravaganza. Well, I slipped on my own This stupid show has existed long enough to be a relevant plot point. First Bumbleburg? Than the world. Of course! I find it oddly fitting that Petunia's only role in this world is to be an exposition dump. An in-universe exposition dump. What you need, Master Larry, is to eschew chocolate. What's eschew? Not much. What's eschew with you? <laughs> What's eschew with you? What's eschew? What's eschew? What's eschew? Alfred, your pun's not even a pun. It's just mad-libbing one. Get it by a car. Get it by a car. Get it by a car. What's this? A pear laptop? How dare you not use my image on your workstation? Face my wrath! Sure, Alfred. Force Larry into an overly painful training regimen while you sit back, drink your overglorified sugar water, and watch Modern Family reruns. So much for designing a program together. I love the color. Is that crimson? It's more of a scarlet. Tempting someone to the point of locking them in their own fantasy world I can reasonably forgive, but compromising their definition of the color red? Now that is evil. Bad Apple goes through the trouble of mounting Jerry's camera upside down for the sake of a humorous visual later. And I'm sitting here thinking, are you crazy? That thing's gonna collapse under its own weight. You're gonna owe Channel 1 News up to $7,000 for this witty little shot. You know, I was about to buy Petunia having two assistants, but then Jimmy Gord appeared as a different character and I'm like, wait, what? And when the rest of Channel 1 News sees that Petunia might be in danger, they send absolutely no one to help. Because, of course, Larry Boy and the Mayor can handle absolutely every crisis in this city. Hey! Use the sidewalk! Ah, <laughs> that's what you get for walking in the middle of the road like a stupid person. I'm taking that sin back. Uh, oh, wait. You need security clearance. Promise not to tell anybody about my secret cave? Okay, so I would add a sin for this miserable excuse for security clearance, but then I'd have to take it back, because the Bad Apple actually does keep the Larry Cave a secret. Sure, it was probably just a ploy to make sure nobody saves him, but wow, a villain keeping her promises! That takes honor! There is literally no reason for the Bad Apple to reveal her spider legs here, other than to tell the audience, Ooh, she's scarier than she's letting on, temptation is evil, platitude, platitude, platitude. 2D building here, 3D building here. Discount Willy Wonka. I promise, Alfred, I would eschew chocolates. Oh, no, no, no. Chew them. Oh, is that why Alfred used an obscure word nobody in their child audience would know about? To service the villain's web of lies. And thus, Ephraim Apley and his lineage would be forced from Bumbleburg, defeated in his plot to rule the little village. And none of his descendants will ever plot revenge for 300 years because reasons. You! Please. Stop right this instant! What do you think you're doing? You can't say every apple's related to Apley when not every apple's related to Apley! We're going to get nasty letters saying, Where's my Uncle Apley? Why don't I have an Uncle Apley? And are you prepared to deal with that? I don't think so. Just stop being so racist! Bumbly boy will be ours! <laughs> Just a few more centimeters and the bad apple would have had direct murder on her hands. Well, legs. But at least they're visible. Oh, well isn't that arrogant. You're going to assume your traction is so tempting that nobody will bother to research what Apley's Funhouse 1 was. I mean, who do you think you are? Street Fighter? A huge cloud of mist filled the air, covering everything in sight, and making this transition incredibly easy to animate. So, we're just going to assume this land of chocolate disappears on its own, right? Because we never see the Larry Cave again after this. My heir! Her heir. Master Larry! Why are you shocked by this, Alfred? How else did you expect Larry Boy to save the mayor? How are you filming this? I know you just stole a camera, but where's the camera now? Whoever enters the funhouse stays in the funhouse. Did that gun just come out of her... You know, I'm just gonna stop before I lose my PG rating. I've got one shot to plug that web shooter. Two. Two shots. 
So using the sports string to weaken the webs I could understand, but how could you possibly have known the broken webs would ricochet and tie up the villain? If you didn't know, and that second part was dumb luck, then your plan basically amounts to just killing a few webs, of which the bad apple could very quickly make more. All citizens are clear of the funhouse! That's not Jim Pool. See, these people are smart. They run away from the giant rolling boulder of death. But not these two. These two are special. Well, assuming that blast off didn't destroy any buildings, now the Bad Apple is another city's problem. Ha ha. Remember, kids, temptation is still out there. But as long as you pack an expensive sports drink and super suction ears, then everything will be okay. I'm the Red Wonder! Or Bobbin. But I'm leaning toward Red Wonder. It's funny, because at one point, Larry Boy was the Robin to Bob's Batman. How times have rapidly changed at Bob's expense. That's all the time we have for today, kids. Thanks, Red Wonder. Ah, <laughs> you did nothing in this episode. This suit is very constricting. I was super! There are no space aliens in Bumbleburg. Hello, boys. It got me by the ear. Swiper! Alfred! Alfred! Chocolate. Why didn't you tell me that before I jumped on his head? Excuse me. That, of course, is our city's great superhero. This episode exists. While I'm not as horrified by these in-the-house redesigns as other people seem to be, I have to wonder why Big Idea decided to carry them over to the original show. I can imagine a child watching this right next to Beauty and the Beat and wondering why everyone looks so different. Why in the world did you bring an elephant onto the countertop? Correction, how in the world did he bring an elephant onto the countertop? Imagination? Then how come he didn't wait to summon the elephant after the countertop? Actually, scratch that, because the episode starts on the typical cry of Roll film! So why do we need these animals in the first place if they already have a film made? Did they just come back to watch? I don't know if it was intentional or just coincidence that the first Post House Veggie Tales video had a message about trusting God's plan. It's like the writers are saying, Hey, you don't like the redesigns? Well screw you! These redesigns are what God wants and we're sticking to it regardless of how much you complain. I think Chris is really gonna love the orange arc, the giant squid, and the really cool dirigible. But if I recall correctly, none of those things were mentioned in the story of Noah. So you're just taking offense to this now? I thought after the Chocolate Bunny Factory, Slushy Bombs, Pie Wars, Islands Perpetual Tickling, Dodgeballs, Tubas, and Amusement Parks, you're just being numbed to all these revisions. These two new characters only exist to have special guest star voices clog their windpipes. You can't even reach the pedals. How are you doing that? I'm gonna go swing, and then right next to that swing, I'll build another swing. Why would you do that? Because it'd be rude if he didn't. You are two people. Two people would need two swings. It's basic logic. But no, let's use this opportunity to sing a song about pears. Does it contribute to the plot? Does it teach a valuable lesson? Is it at least funny? Then I have to say it's soundtrack fodder. Oh. Oh, that's great. You redesign all your main characters beyond recognition, but the penguins, pigs, dogs, and camels can stay. That's wonderful. Grab a tool. It's hammer time. Get it? It's a reference to a song from the 90s. That's automatically funny. I'm gonna just tell Dad that this crazy project has to stop, we'll unbuild this monstrosity, and everything can get back to normal. Be gentle. Of course I will! I'm a lady! Because apparently all women need to be gentle, and this accident just made the carrot less of a woman. Noah's Ark, a lesson in arbitrary gender roles. Remember, kids, it's perfectly safe to jump on fast-moving girders, especially when they're being controlled by this girl. As long as you're wearing a hard hat. You bought the whole hardware store. I take it hardware stores are pretty small in 2500 BC. Mom, it's good to be home, even if I barely recognize it. Seriously, I've been home for five minutes and I don't recognize any of you. Mom, didn't you have a French accent before I left? When I heard what God told your father, I was a little rattled. Our whole world's going to be destroyed in just a few days. That makes me a little rattled. The earth is going to be flooded, Shem. God has seen that no one cares about doing what's right anymore, so he's gonna start over. Well, way to be blunt about all the genocide in this story. Veggie Tales, the only preschool show with a body count over two million. And now let's sing a happy song about the perfectness of God's world just a few days before he completely destroys it. Open the doors! Open the stalls! Get the shovels! It's funny because poop. But I'll be honest, selling the Ark like a cruise ship was pretty cool, and it's the kind of creativity I've come to expect from the show at this point. But I still have to wonder how you sell gym equipment and karaoke machines to a bunch of non-anthro animals. Still a sin, but the fun kind of sin that I actually enjoy. 
And to answer your next big question, we will all help with animal cleanup. And that's poop joke number two. Ah, crap, now I'm doing it. All right, no more poop jokes. That is my duty. You got a name for this ship? I'm keeping it simple. Ark. I think it should be called Noah's Ark. Roll credits. I'm not actually going to skip the silly song this time because unfortunately there's not much silly here to skip. And that's just sad. Okay, kids. Ready for the Easter egg hunt? Making us feel bad for not watching this on Easter. They're particularly careful not to give Junior any lines for this song. Almost as if there'd be too many Jimmys to rustle if he spoke too loud. I don't think a metal detector will help you find plastic eggs, Larry. Cruelty to imaginary snakes. This supposedly rare golden egg is in very plain sight on top of a small hill. Makes you wonder how it took so long for anyone to find it. Really? We need to learn about sharing here? I understand you want to remind us you're still a Christian show, but not during the silly songs, please. I had a dream. There were birds all around me. One. One bird. You've been cooped up in a boat on our front lawn for seven days. And oh, has it rained one drop? No! Genesis 7-4-A, God does tell Noah when the floods would start, so why didn't Noah just tell the rest of the family? The only reason I can think of is so they could make this scene work. No lipstick. Oh, you thought the rising rain would be enough for drama? No, let's throw in lightning strikes and randomly exploding geysers, because if God's gonna destroy the world, he might as well give it some flair. Sorry, th that's not water. That's the second coming of the smooths. To be fair, though, nothing can stop the smooths. Of all the leaks to strike through the ship, how come these giant glass windows are always perfectly fine? Aren't they the most fragile thing on the surface of the ship? Ah, Ark. Ark. God promised that it would rain for 40 days and 40 nights! Oh, so now you let the family in on God's timeline, but not while they're doubting it. I think there's a message in there somewhere. So far, I don't see any signs of- That was easy. Lens flare. Okay, I'll give them some credit. Their umbrella patterns actually match up with the pattern of Noah's umbrella on Minnesota Cuke. However, where they don't match up is the Ark itself. They steal the almost squished by an elephant mid-song joke from the Lion King. Alright, can we just stop with the juvenile poop humor? I always knew this episode was full of crap, but this is ridiculous. Hey, I see what you're doing back there, and joke's on you. The story of Jonah hasn't happened yet. Jim said to meet him here. He just said, meet me by a pile of randomly stacked crates? Even after the redesign, Bob is still excellent at cinema sense. Plan B, a flying machine to take us into the air and away from this seasick life. Is this part of God's plan? Well, how do we know this isn't part of God's plan? And don't say because he hasn't spoken, because if we're to apply this moral to everyday lives, then God doesn't usually speak. What have you been up to all day? <laughs> oh, you think they're playing with hands, guys? Could have said that without the food in your mouth. It'll be okay, Mrs. Hamster. Your heart will go on. But your species won't. That wave could flip us over! In case you couldn't tell, that giant wave just knocked over a whale. I know you had less than two seconds to register what that tiny little thing was, but sorry, nobody plays. They survived this. Oh, I get it. It's the forbidden fruit. In case you couldn't tell that Shem's machine went against God's plan. I mean, I sure didn't. Take a few people out to sea because that's all the balloon will fit, leave the rest of the group to tend for the animals, and when the balloon team finds land, they'll come back for the rest of the group to follow. I don't see how this plan could be flawed other than God's orders to not leave the Ark, which they will later disobey anyway when they send birds out to follow this exact same plan. <laughs> Obligatory Wilhelm. Japheth was literally about to slap the squid with a fish. I guess that's how this tradition got started. This is the Bible story of the Ark! Noah's Ark! And you are not in it! So go home! You can come back for Job! And then Shem got so depressed that he shaved his eyebrows between shots. Wait, never mind. There they are. Dad, I'm wondering if these birds might be a part of God's plan. Maybe. Why would you think that? I'll repeat. One, they're about as likely as the blimp that everyone shunned. And two, it looks like your plan is to speed up the process of God's plan by sending birds to take his sign. In other words... Is this part of God's plan? It's improving on it. I'm just helping him along. Also, what's to say the birds aren't going to be attacked by a giant squid on the way back? Maybe they found places to nest. I'd say so. And that means there's enough land out there for all of us! Seriously? God's plan aside, that's kind of a giant stretch of logic. You kids go forth and multiply! I have no idea what that means. I'll explain it to you later. And here you thought the show stopped doing adult humor. It's all right there in Genesis 6 through 9. Check it out, kids. Yeah, check out the story as it goes further in depth about planetary genocide, sex, and that one time Noah got drunk and naked in his garden. Noah's Ark. Do you really want to know what sets you apart from all the other episodes? You know, it's not the redesigns, it's not the songs, it's not even Wayne Brady, Noah's Ark, of all the VeggieTales episodes I have seen and sinned, you are the most 
boring. Seriously, the redesigns are the only thing that makes you remotely interesting. I mean, look at your title, for starters. Noah's Ark. Is that the most creative thing you can come up with? Did Shem and Noah's Amazing Ark Adventure not test well with the focus groups or something? Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. You know, that, that just screams desperation to me. Yeah, we basically redesigned all our characters, but look, we swear, we're still Veggie Tales. We're still telling Bible stories. Bob and Larry get top billing, even though their roles are equivalent to Timon and Pumba in this story. Yeah, just shove all our main characters up our backside. That, they won't sell copies at all! It's ironic, because their first episode was one of their biggest marketing risks, and their last episode plays it so safe they actually lie about who stars in it. What hurts the most about this episode is that I really can't call it bad. It's not harmful to kids in any way, there's nothing in it that really makes me cringe, but aside from the redesigns, there's really nothing new here. E even for a VeggieTales fan, everything this episode has to offer, we've seen it before and seen it done better. We already know the story of Noah. We've already been taught to trust God's plan, even through the hard times. We've already seen what happens when we don't follow God's plan and do things our own way. In fact, the only reason I could gather for why this episode needs to exist is to prove the show's work is done. Everything good that VeggieTales could do in a 45-minute format has been done before. All the stories, all the lessons, anything further would just result in the show retreading on itself and other properties. Deep down, we've probably known this since at least Pistachio. It's gotten to a point where, for the show to remain fresh and unique, it has to dramatically change its format. And whether we like it or not, that's where VeggieTales in the House comes in. If there's anything good I can say about this spinoff that anyone can agree with, it's different. Episodes are told in 11 minute structure instead of 20 or 40, they all take place in one expansive world instead of each episode having its own canon. The writers spend more time building on a world that's already made instead of always starting from scratch. And the stories are so short yet so plentiful they don't have to be as elaborate or epic as they used to be. For once, Big Idea could just tell the stories they want to tell, and nothing more. This is where Noah's Ark fails. They took a story they could only write about 15 minutes for, and stuffed it with pointless songs and inconsequential action scenes that were all admittedly cool, but contribute nothing that we haven't seen before. VeggieTales in the House may have its stupid moments, its very stupid moments, but it never tried to be more than it can handle. No matter how much I might make fun of all the plot holes and inconsistencies throughout the franchise, new and old, VeggieTales' main goal was always to teach Christian moral values in their own fun and goofy way. And as long as they're doing that, it's all I could ever ask for.